Hi everyone and welcome to Learn Neuroradiology. Today we're going to continue our lecture series about emergent brain tumors. We're going to talk about the non-gliomas or otherwise those tumors that are not primary brain tumors. Uh, if you haven't checked out the other videos, be sure to go back and check them out. Uh, but let's dive into these uh, other common brain tumors that you might encounter in the emergent setting. We're going to focus on CT findings. We're going to focus on how to hone your differential uh, when you see these in the, at the time of presentation. Now, we talked a lot about primary brain tumors in the other videos already, but there's a number of other brain tumors or tumors in the calvarium that you can see that you might think about. We're going to cover those so you can have a sharp differential about them, kind of know what you're seeing in those cases. Meningiomas, metastatic disease, lymphoma, these are pretty commonly encountered in uh, major hospitals, so you definitely need to be aware of them. Calvarial tumors we're going to talk about because they do have a little bit of a special differential, so we'll take a look at those as well. For our first case, we're going to start with a 65-year-old man with three days of left-sided weakness. Uh, so let's take a look at his CT here. I'm just going to play this for you. So from this, you can see why CT is a screening examination. It's, it's a little bit hard to see what's going on. We definitely see so there's some edema in the right cerebral hemisphere. Uh, as we come down here, it looks like there's some mass effect on the frontal horn of this lateral ventricle. Again, more vasogenic edema there. We do kind of get the notion that maybe there's a rounded mass here, but it's very hard to see by CT. I mean, there's really highlights on how much you can miss by CT. Again, a little bit of a rounded mass there. So we see there's probably a mass. It looks almost like it's centered around that bone or in the extraaxial space there. Uh, so let's, uh, let's take a look here. Again, some additional CT images. Uh, here's a bone window now. Is there a little bit of hyperostosis around there? Maybe I could convince you that there is, but this is really hard to see. We just see some mass effects, some surrounding edema. So you're definitely going to need an MRI in this patient. We think there's probably an extraaxial mass along that right sphenoid there. It does look a little dense. There is that right frontal edema. We think there's some hyperostosis. Our differential is really a meningioma. Uh, metastatic disease, lymphoma, they definitely can, you can have extraaxial masses that, but by far, meningioma is the most common extraaxial tumor in, uh, in patients. Uh, we want to recommend an MRI. So we're making our impression there. We see a hyperdense mass. It's likely extraaxial along the sphenoid wing, suspicious for meningioma. In this case, I wouldn't even necessarily give a differential, but you can if you want. With the edema and mass effect on the frontal lobe is seen, you want to get an MRI of the brain with contrast. Uh, so I want to mention that. Here's some images from the MRI. Here's a T2. You see it confirms that area that we were looking at is abnormal. Looks like there's a little T2 cleft there. Again, confirming that we're probably looking at an extraaxial mass. Here's our pre-contrast. It's pretty isodense to the adjacent gray matter, but on the post-contrast, it's solidly enhancing, it's avidly enhancing, and it's homogeneous. Here you see some hypo-intense material there. That's probably that hyperostotic bone that we were seeing there on the CT. Now I'm going to scroll through this post-contrast imaging for you here. Right, so that's pretty good. You can see that uh, contrast enhancing mass. You scroll back here, you can see pretty well defined, very homogeneous, really adherent to that bone. Do we see a little bit of dural tail here? Probably, I think we do. Uh, so we feel pretty confident this is extraaxial mass. There's some involvement of the subjacent bone. So I think that we're probably dealing with a meningioma. Meningiomas are the most common brain tumors, or primary brain tumors. They're the most common extraaxial mass. They have all the features that we saw here, right? They tend to be homogeneous. They can be T2 variable, but they're often T2 hyperintense. You might see hyperostosis. They can be hyperperfusing and FDG avid. So don't let that confuse you into thinking it's definitely a metastatic lesion. You want to report how much mass effect there is, if there's bone involvement, or if there's adjacent parenchymal edema or enhancement. These are all concerning features. But again, in this case, it turns out to be a grade one anyway. Low-grade meningiomas can also have edema. Okay, so that's a nice pearl for you. That doesn't mean there's brain invasion. It doesn't mean it's a high-grade tumor. You don't want to use words like atypical uh, because that specifically refers to other subtypes of meningioma. Our second case here is a 50-year-old woman with loss of consciousness. Show you some images from the CT here. Just scroll through. 
doesn't take long to figure out. You've got a lot of problems there. I'm going to scroll back through there. You can see there's a lot of masses. Uh, many of them are hyperdense. Luckily, you've got some fluid levels. They are as dense as hemorrhage. So you've got a number of hemorrhagic lesions. So it looks like you've got masses that have some hemorrhage. That's pretty, uh, pretty concerning there. Here you see just a couple of representative slices from that region. Again, hyperdense masses, edema around them, multiple, multiple lesions. Uh, in this case, you want to describe that they're multiple. You want to describe that they're predominantly superdentorial. They're hyperdense with areas of hemorrhage. Those hematocrit levels like really tell you that there's hemorrhage there. It's not just hyperdense masses. They do have some surrounding edema, not so much in the way of midline shift or downward herniation or anything, though. Your differential here, we have to think about metastatic disease. Uh, other things, you might think about trauma. I mean, you can definitely have contusions like this, but it's, the distribution's unusual. If you had a trauma this bad, you would know from the history. Infections such as septic emboli can hemorrhage like this and have this appearance. Amyloid, uh, definitely something to think about. Uh, you can definitely have multiple hemorrhages, but this extent uh, would be would be unusual. Uh, definitely want to recommend an MRI. You want to think about a systemic workup for malignancy. So in your impression for your CT, you want to describe this as a multifocal supernatorial masses with hemorrhage and mass effect. You want to go ahead and say it's suspicious for hemorrhagic metastatic disease. Here, it's close enough that I'm really not putting a lot of other stuff in my differential, but we do recommend an MRI of the brain to look for other lesions, also to work them up for systemic malignancy. Here's some images from the MRI. You see the flare. Not a lot, maybe a little bit of edema around that thing of the thalamus, but not a whole lot of flare associated with these. This is a pre-contrast T1 in the middle here. You're seeing some intrinsic T1 hyperintensity from the blood products that are there. However, when you give contrast, you see there is some enhancement of these lesions that didn't show up that well. And you see the number of lesions that you're seeing is greater. So there's probably a bunch of lesions here and you're only seeing some of them that have hemorrhage. So a lot of intracranial enhancing lesions. This turned out to be metastases from melanoma. The most common brain metastases you're gonna see are lung, breast, and melanoma. If you have hemorrhage, you might specifically think about renal cell carcinoma and melanoma, as was in this case. These tend to be well-defined enhancing masses. They can have edema, they can have hemorrhage. Now remember about 50% of metastases are solitary. So just because you have a solitary lesion, you still wanna include metastases in your differential sometimes. 30% uh, of uh, cases are gonna have three or more, such as in this where they're essentially innumerable. Uh, most of these are in the cerebral hemispheres, although basal ganglia and cerebellum can also be involved. Uh, as I remember, half of brain metastases are solitary. Let's move on to this additional case here. We've got a 51-year-old woman with HIV, nausea, vomiting, and dizziness. Going to give you some images from a CT here. Let's play through those. All right, we'll scroll back through there. The supertentorial brain looks kind of okay. I'm not seeing a whole lot, a whole lot there. Um, maybe there's some asymmetry of the caudates, like on this image here. But the real uh, meat of this case is like into the posterior fossa, where the posterior fossa looks really swollen and really full. And maybe there's some hyperdensity there. Looks like there's definitely some swelling. Is there so, kind of something going on in the right middle cerebellar peduncle there? So I think that uh, cerebellum looks looks pretty swollen. Uh, here you see just a couple of slices from uh, from that level. Again, maybe hyperdensity is as multiple masses in the cerebellum. Maybe the caudate looks a little, a little funny too. Uh, so we have multifocal edema, some periventricular edema, some cerebellar edema. We're thinking there are maybe hyperdense masses. Uh, the differential, when we're thinking about hyperdense masses, metastatic disease, lymphoma, maybe multifocal infection like a, like a cerebritis or ventriculitis. Uh, we want to recommend, again, an LP and MRI. You can take a little caution in doing an LP, but even with that swelling of the cerebellum, probably okay. You might think twice about taking a lot of fluid, though. You might just take just a little bit of fluid for testing. On your impression, we want to call that a multifocal hyperdense masses with edema and the cerebellum, paraventricular white matter. We want to think about lymphoma, multifocal infection, particularly given that this patient had HIV. We're going to recommend an MRI to look at this further. Here's some images from the MRI. We see the flare. Have some flare edema in the cerebellum, effacement of the fourth ventricle there, kind of this mass-like expansion of the left uh, cerebellum and paramedian cerebellum. This is just a T2 showing kind of the same things. If we go up a little higher, we're seeing that periventricular stuff looks much worse than we could even see on the CT. Again, it's kind of impressive how much stuff you can miss on the CT. Caudate is expanded. 
the uh, splenium of the corpus callosum, uh, I mean, genu of the corpus callosum there looks, uh, looks pretty bad. Definitely, and on T2, something you might think about this kind of intermediate to low T2 that does trigger a little bit of a special differential. Maybe think about lymphoma, granulomatous disease. Here's the pre and post contrast. Avid enhancement, pretty solid looking. Maybe some little areas of necrosis, but solid enhancement is the dominant feature here. In the periventricular regions, again, solid nodular enhancement extending across the corpus callosum. Interestingly, that caudate part, not that enhancing, uh, so it's a little bit heterogeneous. Here's our diffusion, another nice clue. Those areas of involvement are pretty bright on DWI. They're pretty dark on ADC, lymphoma, uh, and sarcoid, TB. These are specifically things that can do that, but in multifocal disease in a patient with HIV, you want to be thinking about primary CNS lymphoma. It's a relatively rare disease that's associated with HIV, although I feel like we're seeing a little less of it uh, with patients more effectively on antiretroviral therapy. Uh, these are B cell lymphocytes in the parenchyma. And you can detect it often at CSF if you do a lumbar puncture, so that can be helpful. Paraventricular white matter and basal ganglia are common locations, so it's a nice uh, clue in this case. The corpus callosal involvement is a nice clue. But think about this if you see T2 hypointense lesions, multiple enhancing lesions, areas with reduced diffusion and solid enhancement. Uh, now, there can be a little bit of a difference in how it enhances. Immunocompetent patients are more likely to have solid enhancement, while HIV patients or patients on immunosuppression are more likely to have cystic necrotic lesions, maybe more mimic like toxoplasmosis or metastatic disease. Um, multi multifocal paraventricular lesions should always be high suspicion for CNS lymphoma, unless you have another explanation. This next case, we're looking at an 80 year old woman. All only history I've got for you is that she has a complex medical history. Uh, all right, here. So we see some images from a CT. Uh, we have a brain window. Something funny is going on here. Uh, we see something outside the calvarium. We see a modeled appearance to the calvarium itself on the bone window. We see intracranial involvement. So this is kind of a transpatial mass. We see a lot of edema in the left cerebral hemisphere, maybe some hyperdense involvement there. So we see a lesion centered in the bone. We might think about uh, what I was talking about earlier, about specifically having a differential for calvarial lesions. Uh, this has both intracranial and extracranial components, some lytic bone destruction, mass effect on the frontal lobe. Now, when you see a lesion that's centered in the calvarium, you should think about this being on your differential, okay? Metastatic disease, lymphoma, meningiomas, and myeloma. This is a pretty special differential for this and can really, can really help you in this case. Definitely want to start that workup for malignancy. Definitely want to get an MRI of the brain to see if you see other lesions and see if you can characterize that a little bit better. When you're making your CT impression, you want to describe this as a lytic lesion centered in the calvarium. We want to talk about how it has both intracranial and extracranial components. We'll talk about that mass effect on the frontal lobe, and we want to recommend an MRI as well as a systemic workup for malignancy. So here we see the MRI from this patient. Again, you see a lesion looks like it's centered in the bone. Looks like we see the dura here displaced, and we see these kind of linear stripey things like kind of coming out of the bone on T2. We see an intracranial component here, maybe a little bit of a CSF cleft there. It's hard to tell on this, on this T2. We see edema in that hemisphere, like the same as we were seeing on the CT. Flare simply confirms that. You see a low or kind of iso intense mass here, involvement of the bone, intracranial and extracranial involvement. Here we see the pre and post contrast. Uh, it's pretty iso-intense to the adjacent brain here. Uh, and then when you give contrast, it avidly enhances. So it's very solidly enhancing. Uh, you see the dura there, so it's crossing the dura, it's crossing the bone, has this model appearance involving the bone. Uh, so you've got a calvarial lesion uh, involving the intracranial compartment. If you saw just in isolation this component, you might think it's a meningioma. That radiating feature coming out of it on T2, also classic for meningioma. So if you have to lead with something, probably lead with meningioma in this case. And this did turn out to be a grade three meningioma. As I said, these are the most common brain tumors, most common extraxial mass. In this case, the bone involvement is extending uh, both inside and outside the calvarium. And uh, there's a lot of brain involvement here, a lot of uh, edema. Again, so this is a real uh, uh, sort of pearl for you here. When you see these transpatial calvarial masses, think meningioma, metastases, lymphoma, and myeloma. Those should be the four things that kind of roll off your tongue. In this case, it was a meningioma, but they often are going to look the same.
Um, metastases do tend to cause greater destruction of the underlying bone. In this case, there was a lot of preservation of that bone, so a lot of the underlying scaffolding was still there. That's a little less common in metastases, but, but you really can't reliably tell. Uh, this is a case of B-cell lymphoma. Looks very similar to the case we just saw, okay? You see destruction of the bone, lytic lesion centered in the bone. You see this mass-like thing coming off here. Very similar on post-contrast as well. Again, a intracranial component, the dura lifted up, the uh, involvement of the bone there. Very hard to differentiate there from that case that we saw though. So you want to be sure to include those on your differential. Uh, here's a case of myeloma. Again, a very similar appearance. Okay, you do have more destruction of the bone here. So there's no real bone there. A relatively homogeneous enhancing extraaxial mass involving both sides of the calvarium. This one turned out to be myeloma. In summary, when you think about common tumors in the brain, uh, you think about whether they're in the parenchyma and they could be primary brain tumors. When they are extraaxial, we think about meningiomas being the most common extraaxial lesion. When you have multiple lesions, maybe think about metastatic disease and lymphoma. And when you have it centered in the calvarium, think about that differential that we just talked about. Uh, for most tumors, you're going to need an MRI to say the next step, but you can help identify where an LP or systemic malignancy workup might be helpful. They can get those started a little sooner and you can sound a little smarter in your differentials uh, in the cases. So thanks for tuning in to this uh, coverage of the uh, sort of spectrum of intracranial non-gliomas uh, that you might have. Uh, be sure to tune back in for the last two videos. We're going to talk about mimics of brain tumors. We're going to talk about some of the red flags that you might need to report. Uh, thanks for tuning in today. Be sure to uh, check out the other videos on learnerradiology.com. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel so you get notifications when additional videos come out. Thank you.